a uh, phrase that Michael Lewitt from Walmart taught me is, what's different about the 1990s versus now is that the future is here. The future is not the future. It, we are in it. We're living it today. Welcome to the Be Epic Podcast, brought to you by the Sam M. Walton College of Business at the University of Arkansas. I'm your host, Brent Williams. Together, we'll explore the dynamic landscape of business and uncover the strategies, insights, and stories that drive business today. Today, uh, I have two colleagues with me. I have Dr. Remco Van Hoke from the Department of Supply Chain Management, and I have Dr. Mary Lassity from the Department of Information Systems. Mary Remco, thank you for joining me today. Thanks well, so much for having us. Yes, we're delighted mm. to be here. Well, one reason why I asked you to be on the podcast was about some of the really interesting research that you two have been doing together. Uh, so I want to spend most of our time there. But before we do that, I'd love for everyone in our audience to get to know you a, a little bit. And you both have really interesting backgrounds and are making really large contributions to the Walton College. And maybe, Remco, could I start with you? Uh, sure. Just uh, if you'd introduce yourself. Love to hear about your background because it's an interesting one of this mix of academics and industry. That's correct. Yeah, I started teaching and researching um, in Europe um, and then stayed involved with the Cranfield School of Management as a visiting professor over the years while I went into industry to practice supply chain and procurement, held a number of roles in a number of industries, and then uh, was grateful for the opportunity that the Walton College provided to come back to academia on a more full-time basis to help develop leaders of the future while staying involved in industry as an advisor and as an educator. Yeah, and primarily the you're, you're teaching procurement. It's probably yep. a little more broad than that, but that's really kind of the primary expertise that you're bringing to that's that correct. department and curriculum. Yep, that's correct. Across all levels, uh, undergrad, graduate. Uh, we're teaching our master's in supply chain uh, this semester. Great program. And executive ed as well. Yeah. And executive MBA, right? In the past. Correct. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, across all of those. Mm -hmm. um, well, and Mary, uh, how, how about you? Well, I have been with the Walton College now for five and a half years. I can't believe how fast it goes. And I was initially brought here to be the director of the Blockchain Center of Excellence. And um, in, as an information system scholar, I've studied for a very long time how enterprises adopt emerging technologies, blockchain just being one of them. Mm -hmm. I've also studied um, artificial intelligence for about the last 10 mm -hmm. years, looking at organizational adoption. Mm -hmm. And so then I was really excited to meet Remco because he was studying blockchain when I first got here in supply chains. And then he brought me in on this project of how enterprises are using artificial intelligence. Hmm. Well, the, the, you all in your own right uh, are fantastic researchers. And then I've just seen this synergy that you two have created uh, that's made you even more productive. Um, I think, uh, Mary, you told me nine papers that you either have published together, yes. I believe. Um, and what's really interesting about those, some of those, where you're publishing, three in the Harvard Business Review, two in the Sloan Management Review, and those are read and consumed not only by academics, but also an industry audience. Um, so why the, it, you two are clearly attracted to that industry and academic audience. What makes that I don't know, such a fit for, for you two. I think, uh, so first of all, procurement uh, and supply chain is a very applied field. One of the many things I love about our field is you can turn things really, really concrete uh, in a business setting. If you think of the desire to become a more sustainable business, well, if you turn to procurement, you can make that very, very concrete quickly. Um, that's number one. And then number two, it's a young field. You know, there's so much to in so much potential and so much to innovate. And what's been really, really exciting about engaging with the companies that have partnered with us in our research is to travel the, very much the frontier of knowledge and practice um, to try and learn from those, but learn from those in a way that others can benefit from it as well, so that you can make modest contributions towards progressing mm -hmm. both the the thinking, the science, as well as the practice uh, yeah. of supply chains. Yeah. Well, you know, Mary, I remember, I don't know if it was five years ago, it was probably close to that, maybe one of the first conversations you and I had about the Blockchain Center was, 
you know, you, you said Brent technology is moving fast. And, and if we're successful, we're going to move through this technology fast and then we're going to move to the next one. And that's sort of that's really played out in a fairly short period of time. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. So I, I've, now I'm researching and teaching metaverse, mm-hmm. right, and in addition to AI. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why I love being a scholar and a teacher mm-hmm. and doing this practice-based research, because I get to learn along with everybody else, and I'm never bored. Something's always new. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, just to, to piggyback on what Remka was saying, because we study early adopters who are successful, mm-hmm. I think our research has a lot of impact because the first question everybody asks about new technology is, who else is doing it? Yeah. Or what kind of business benefits are they getting? Yeah. And so we come up with what we call action principles on how mm-hmm. you can leverage these technologies to get business value. Mm-hmm. And in, in one of these articles in Rimco, you were the lead author on this. Um, it's one thing that stuck out to me. It was a, it was the article, How Walmart Automated Supplier Negotiations in the Harvard Business Review. And the piece of it that really stuck in my mind, I mean, there's a great story there, but you had, I don't remember if it was four or five points, but like, you know, if you're thinking about this, do these things. Um, and it just took the research and the story and made it very actionable. Uh, so we're talking about this research. I'm going to get you all, um, Remco, I might start with you. Um, as I look across it, it's this intersection of AI, automation, uh, a procurement focus that broadens to supply chain in certain of the papers that you've written. Am I anywhere close to describing it correctly? I think you're spot on. I think it's a really, really fast-moving field, building on Mary's point from a few years ago. There's so much interest in, in, in AI, and there's so many questions being asked by researchers about what is the potential in supply chain, and, and what is it going to do? What's it going to do for the future of work? What is it going to mean for our students that are going into this field in terms of what their day-to-day will, will look like? And, um, you know, it's, it's a very, very bright future. It's, it's really, really incredible what potential it can bring for procurement specifically to grow its business contributions and to grow the coverage of spend, uh, the impact on supplier relations, on business resilience. There's a ton of potential there. And what's really, really cool is that we've been privileged to be able to work with a few innovators that are really pushing the thinking and the practice, who have generously shared with us to let us learn from them and let us together with them, um, because that piece you referenced is co-authored with Walmart executives, in fact, um, to share that uh, to advance the thinking and, and help others as well. Yeah, that piece uh, co-authored by the two of you, but uh, Michael DeWitt mm-hmm. is a co-author from Walmart, and Travis Johnson correct is a is a co-author. Tell us a little bit about that study, if you don't mind, because I you know I'm a supply chain professor, so I found it pretty interesting. So it, the technology in there is it's an AI chatbot that will over chat negotiate terms and conditions with existing suppliers of Walmart, and. Um, That's very counterintuitive, right? Because when people think of a procurement professional, you think of something that somebody that can do a lot and probably is really good at negotiating. Mm -hmm. Well, here's an example of don't let the buyer do that. Let the bot do it, and you can get incremental savings and and business value. Um, That was the counterintuitive element to that. If you dig into the story, Part of why this is augmentation of procurement rather than replacement of buyers is that the bot is able to target suppliers that buyers don't necessarily have sufficient time to properly negotiate with. So the truth of the matter is that when you look at a procurement organization, typically you have thousands of suppliers, um, and quite a large number of those fall in what's so-called tail spent. So they are relatively small when look when you look at the amount of money you spend with them, the number of transactions you have with them. And so they're not necessarily an area where professional buyers can spend a lot of time um, developing relationships and negotiating terms and conditions. Mm-hmm. What this technology does is let the bot take care of it. Yeah. Let the bot take care of it so that you can negotiate with those that you normally don't have time to negotiate with. Mm. Allowing the buyer to spend more time on the things that are most important to that business. Exactly. There's two elements to what does it mean for a buyer. Number one, you can focus on more on strategy and you can focus more on critic, most critical relationships, number one. But number two, the bot doesn't – it's controlled AI. Mm-hmm. So the bot doesn't just – 
come up with what am I going to negotiate with whom. The buyer has a key role in the selecting the suppliers to target, um, providing data on who to approach in what way, and developing the negotiation scenarios um, as well so that the bot can then execute. Um, so it is true, a perfect example of procurement augmentation um, to make the buyer more impactful and to help procurement grow the value it's generating in key relationships as well as in the business. You know, one thing that interested me in the article was, I don't know if you use the term adoption rate from the suppliers, but um, that the term I'm using, and it was really high, the number of suppliers in the in the pilot yep. that that adopted. So clearly they're seeing benefit. What What benefit do you think the supplier is getting from this? So there's a couple of benefits. Uh, first of all, um, they are in a negotiation with Walmart. So rather than just having to accept the term and conditions that Walmart normally applies, there's an opportunity to discuss those, and there's an opportunity to make decisions, which they previously might not have had. So that's one benefit. Number two, the technology, which is Pactum, uh, that they use, allows the supplier to think, to go back. into. So there's lots of flexibility in the hands of the supplier uh, to put control over the negotiation in their hands. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's a real uh, a real benefit. The other thing, and it has to do with how Walmart approaches negotiations, if you have a deal with Walmart, you have a deal with Walmart. So the follow through on those agreements um, is very high as well, which is a real benefit to suppliers. Like a pitfall in procurement is, I negotiated with you yesterday, but today I want to talk to you a little bit further. And that's highly frustrating and can be borderline you know, unethical uh, in terms of how you approach suppliers. There's none of that in this. There's none of that is. The negotiation ends with an agreement, with a commitment, a contract, crystal clear, super transparent. But I'll let you add on. Those are just some of the points I you come up with. Well, they're, they're, they're pretty much all of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, you, you all have focused in Procurema, but then the, the, about a year later, you, you published a paper about the use of AI to prevent supply chain disruptions. Mm -hmm. And what a, what a timely topic. Um, you know, and it's been timely for probably forever, right? We've experienced supply chain disruptions forever, but we all were hyper aware of the disruptions in COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as we, as we sit now, you know, we're seeing severe disruptions in shipping lanes uh, across the world and, you know, driving costs. Um, so while AI doesn't solve that exactly, tell us a little bit about, you know, just kind of where this research. Let me tell you, can I share yeah. where we where this research actually started yeah. and where it ended up? So Remco has incredible contacts also with the Harvard Business Review and uh, after we've had a couple of successes, now he's getting asked to, you know, ba basically commission articles. And so he was asked to, what is the role of small to mid-sized suppliers in helping de-risk supply chains? Mm -hmm. So he called me and said, do you want to partner on this? And I said, yes. So we spent the summer focusing on the role of small to mid-sized enterprises. And it was almost like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole because the interesting stories that kept coming up were related to these new tools of artificial intelligence. And so we decided, let's just write the article we want to write. <laughs> and the uh, the editor was very pleased with it. So that that's the background story on that one. And this one I thought was really interesting because we also look at other adopters of Pactum. So Remco just explained how Walmart is using it. But we also have a smaller company that has used it and also Maersk. So we have that story in there. And then we have two other tools that are, are doing different things. So maybe you want to talk about one of the, some of the other things that we're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Scout B is a technology that's featured um, in there. And you're right, by the way, on Pactum, I'm helping several companies explore how can I potentially use it, which is just great in terms of how research leads to research and opportunities. Would you tell us companies. a little bit about Pactum? Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a really cool young tech uh, company that um, um, the article that, uh, that you reference features one of the several use cases that they have and the journey of adoption has progressed including in Walmart into other uh, into other use cases and they are squarely focused on using AI to um, drive supplier interaction so that the buyer doesn't have to do it so um, 
and and but there is applications in logistics, uh, different industries, different markets. Uh, I'm helping several companies kind of think through how could that work for me, and so there's a lot more innovation to add there. It's really kind of cool. The other one you mentioned was um, Scout B. Uh, Scout B is a service that can help you identify supply options faster using AI than a buyer might if they didn't use the technology. Mm -hmm. And that has real premium value if you think of supply chain disruptions, right? Because what happens when a supply chain disrupts? Well, you're not the only company suffering from it. Your competitors are probably facing very similar issues. Mm -hmm. And what happens? We start scrambling for, is there any spare inventory? Is there any spare capacity? Can I call on somebody else? Um, everybody goes through that scramble, but you're, you're all after a tiny bit of incremental capacity that may be left. Mm -hmm. And so the value of using AI is that it can put intelligence in the hands of buyers faster. Yeah. You'll know about those options faster than your competitor. Mm -hmm. And that gives you an edge when you're all rushing to the last little bit of capacity that's left in the market. And for, and for now, because what ha this is why you have to constantly innovate. Right, so the early adopters are going to have that strategic advantage, and then it's going to become a level playing field when everybody starts adopting it, and they'll have yep. to go to another innovation. Yeah. yeah, but but also it could. I'm thinking out loud here, but while it could give you that competitive advantage in getting the capacity, there is an advantage in. All right, maybe you found out you didn't get it, you know, but you found it out faster, right, and increased your efficiency of what's the next solution potentially. Correct. Correct. There's two added points if I may. The first one is we also feature an example of Unilever who actually uses that technology to support its efforts to grow supplier diversity and inclusion. So what supplier diversity and inclusion teams in a procurement organization typically do, and I had a team like this when I ran procurement at Disney, they help buyers find options that are with uh, diverse suppliers that they could consider um, in their sourcing efforts. And so Unilever has used this to very rapidly grow the pool of supply options as input to buying decisions. So it has a use case that is more in the ESG space um, as well. So AI can help you drive progress in ESG um, as well. And the second point, um, we also spoke to Orchestro, which is uh, a predictive uh, procurement technology. And one of the things that they shared um, on the, uh, was that sometimes when they go through the existing supplier master data and all the transactions, you think of the massive data lake that companies typically have, they very often can uncover um, supply options within existing suppliers that, have, that are untapped, mm -hmm. right? So I'm scrambling for product A, but I didn't realize that, you know, the supplier of product B could also provide product A, I just never have asked them. And so that's another area where you could improve resilience um, if you put AI in the hands of buyers. The, the other really cool thing about that tool is it, it scrapes details, right, down to, I think, the, the SKU level. It'll generate a request for proposal based on historical data, email it to the supplier, and if the supplier says yes, bang, they go, or the, if the supplier counteracts, it iterates. So it's more than just, here's a list of potential people to look at yeah when when you all have worked with companies as they implemented such technology talk a little bit about the people side of it because you know you're right you, you think <laughs> about it. like yeah. thanks for bringing it up yeah. data technology yeah. process people and, and people are always a really big part of the change management you know you know mary was the one that taught me a lot about blockchain and the main thing that she taught me the technology is the easy part it's about considering it wisely uh, and being able to approach uh, potential adoption uh, mindfully um, as well. Uh, and that very much applies to these, like, these technologies, yes, buyers get savvy in them, but they don't have to, they don't have to code, they don't have to develop it. They've got very capable, you know, solutions providers for that. The, MI, the Sloan article mm -hmm. actually features a very old technology that you'll remember from the 90s. It's called e-auctions. Yeah. Um, and it was actually 
It was Michael Lewitt from Walmart International uh, that brought this up because he actually worked for one of the original e-auction companies in the 90s um, and brought that technology many, many years later into Walmart when he, uh, when he started running um, uh, procurement internationally there. And so the, a lot of the article is not only about how do you adopt new technologies, but also are there further opportunities to benefit from proven, tried, and tested existing technologies? And that's all about people and change and, and leadership. Well, if you're listening to this, um, we will put link these articles uh, in, in the notes uh, so that you can find them. Uh, because I think, um, I think after listening, you're going to want to read these. Let me, let me switch gears uh, with you for just a moment. So, you know, one thing that is really interesting in listening to all of these stories, think about the number of companies you all have just mentioned to me. Uh, so industry, you're deeply engaged with all kinds of companies in your research. And when I think about the Walton College, I'll, you know, I will say, I think our single biggest competitive advantage is our relationships and connectedness to industry. Um, I think it is, it's pervasive in the classroom, you know, in the events that we're doing, but it's also pervasive, particularly in your research. So, um, well, I guess maybe, you know, talk a little bit about how you develop those relationships and companies need to get value out of doing this. And clearly they are because they've been doing it with you multiple times. Yeah, I mean, I'm very grateful for all the uh, the research that we're able to do with, with really cool companies. I think you referenced the Walmart example. That's just a really cool relationship that I'm very, continue to be very grateful for, uh, which is larger than just the research, um, because we actually do executive ed uh, for that organization. Um, we do some coaching, and out of that has grown the opportunity to also learn with them at the frontier of, of, of practice. Um, what's cool about Walmart and the executives that we're working with in particular is that they're really motivated to innovate and to, to, to think forward and do it collaboratively um, as well, which I think is very rare, plus being able to willing to share learnings so that together we can drive a little bit of progress. Obviously, they're increasingly recognized for the innovator and the leader in the space that they, uh, that they are, and they're asked to talk a lot about some of the things that we research together um, in industry, and good for them and good for the field. Absolutely. You know, Mary, you've been working with industry, I think, 30 your whole years. career. 30 yeah. years, yeah, yeah. People talk about a virtuous cycle between your research aligning with your teacher, but I like to think of it as a cyclone because it's that much more <laughs> impactful. Um, probably a, a recent example is, you know, when I was the director of the Blockchain Center of Excellence for five years, we had 12 executive advisory board member firms, including including Walmart and J.B. Hunt and Tyson. And uh, we did research in those companies as well as others. And then we have blockchain curriculum. And I noticed we there is no such thing as a blockchain textbook. So I went and wrote it. And it's mostly based on all of the case study work that we have done. And now that textbook is used at 14 other universities around the world. And I do want to say I get no royalties because I didn't. <laughs> I just like to say that I always waive my royalties because I don't want to make students be lining my pockets. But um, I think that's a good example. And now that I'm teaching this metaverse, I don't have a book out yet, but some of the early papers that we've done, th those are readings in our classroom. And we also bring those, um, we also bring those executives into the classroom. They love to guest lecture. And our students want to know, well, what kind of careers can I get in Metaverse? So we brought in Accenture and, and what their career paths look like. So our cyclone, our virtuous cyclone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the teacher-scholar model, you know, where, um, where your synergy is really happening amongst everything you're doing. And I particularly love how I, I think this is I think I'm, I'm catching the phrase right that you said that you are learning with these companies at the frontier of practice. And what's interesting, Rimco, Mary, as you do that, let's say, you know, you're, you're, you're writing paper all, all week and, and working on this research. Well, next Monday or next Tuesday, you can't help but talk about that in the classroom, right? It's just, it's what's on your mind. And so students are actually seeing that well in some ways before it's published. It's because you're researching and teaching at the same time. That's correct. Um, I know you do this. I do this. I also bring you know, my uh, industry partners into the classroom as guest lecturers to tell what 
wasn't in the paper, but they should also know. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> one cool thing that we're going to do both in my um, master's in supply chain as well as in my EMBA class this semester, we're going to actually have the CEO and founder of Pactum come in for a session where he'll open up about the technology, but we're gonna have our master's students negotiate against a bot in the classroom. So we're gonna really bring that technology to life and have them uh, live it through, and I I can't wait for that session. I hope you invite me. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Uh, Well, you mentioned Metaverse, uh, but I just kind of mentioned, was thinking for the two of you, kind of what's next? What's got you interested in, the curiosity of research questions that you're thinking about for the future? I, st- I still think AI has a lot of legs. And I started studying this technology in 2014, primarily with IBM's Watson, which at the time would cost an enterprise, I mean, tens of millions of dollars. And the price point of these technologies combined with the massive amount of computing power, I think we've finally reached that tipping point of AI adoption in enterprises. I mean, we've been saying this since the 1950s, (laughs) you know, AI is coming, AI is coming, AI is here. So that's, uh, I think we'll we'll continue to do research on that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's a paper just published by some prominent European scholars about AI and supply chain, and they kind of looked at the inventory and they only found one paper, you know, on AI and procurement, and it's the one you just brought up. So clearly, we have a lot more to learn. Uh, we have a lot more to learn, and it's moving really, really quickly. Uh, a phrase that Michael Lewitt from Walmart taught me is, what's different about the 1990s versus now is that the future is here. The future is not the future. It, we are in it. We're living it today. Um, and... Um, and this is one of the many things I love about working with Mary. Like, she's an incredibly accomplished scholar. Um, and despite being distinguished and endowed, she is still very curious. And she's always interested in learning uh, learning more. Um, and and she's great and engaging with, with industry to do just that. And, and, and so what, what I'm interested in, doing more work with the really cool companies we get to work with and hopefully doing more work with Mary. Well, when I think about you two and I'm thinking about our vision as a college, you know, I, I always just boil it down to we want to be thought leaders in business and catalysts for transforming the lives of our students. And, and clearly you're doing both. So thank you for the amazing work you're doing, pushing the boundaries of knowledge, working with companies and impacting students every single week in the Walton College. I appreciate both of you. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Brent. On behalf of the Walton College, thank you for joining us for this captivating conversation. To stay connected and never miss an episode, simply search for Be Epic on your preferred podcast service.